Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of the cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you, he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. And if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul when I removed, <clears throat> whom I removed from before you. Your house, your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Tonight I'll be reading from Psalm 89 starting verses 1 through 4. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. And now starting in verse 19. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. 
I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Also I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Please stand. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father and our King, we come before you this evening, or whatever time it is around the world, acknowledging in this season that uh, by your hand down through the ages, you sent the one who reconciled us to you, Jesus of Nazareth, and that he promised when he was here on earth among us that if we became his subjects and receive forgiveness of our sins through him, we would be imparted the gift of his Holy Spirit, and that that Holy Spirit would enlighten us about your character and teach us from your word. And so tonight we ask for that illuminating light of the Spirit as we look at the lives of those you called in the context of your holy scriptures. This is our request, we pray, in the name of him who redeemed us. Amen. Please be seated. A few years ago, when I first began coming to, uh, to Israel, uh, I made a new friend. His, uh, his wife is at the Anglican school. His name is Roy. Now, Roy and I um, both have white beards. And men of our age, when we establish friendships, often work it out to occasionally get together. In Roy's, in my case, it began with ice cream on hot days. Uh, it's a little hard to get ice cream in Jerusalem these days, uh, and it's a little cold to, to eat it sometimes, but there's always hot coffee. And so a, a couple of weeks ago, the two of us got together up near the open market at the end of Jaffa Road, 
not at the end of Jaffa Road, on Jaffa Road. And since there were no tables and chairs on which we were allowed to sit, we looked for some public place we could, be, we could sit down. And there was a stone planter, and so we sat side by side and had our coffee and chatted. Across from us, diagonally, another chap was sitting eh, probably about our age as well. And he looked up at us and he said, are you American? Now, Roy grew up in London. And so I said, well, I am, but I don't know that we should visit that on my friend. And he laughed. He said, well, I'm from America, too. I'm from Brooklyn. He said, and I, I came here, made Aliyah, and taught English in a yeshiva. And so we chatted a bit about things as one does over coffee. And then out of the blue, he said, you know, that, that verse in the Tanakh, he said, it doesn't say born of a virgin. It says she was a young woman, just a lass. And I kind of woke up and uh, didn't know quite what to respond because clearly he was challenging what he thought I was. Then he said to me, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. And so we began this discussion about the heritage of the Virgin Mary and her place in, in the gospel story. There was more to the conversation than that, but it's probably all we need tonight because it's that, that one reference in the Tanakh, however much one wants to dispute it, that takes us to the topic of this evening in the scriptures, the life and work of Mary. And I think it has a lesson for us, and that lesson would be this, that Mary illustrates the life of a disciple whose spiritual maturity is revealed in proportion to her capacity for obedience. Or maybe put more practically for us, a disciple's spiritual matur maturity is proportional to his or her capacity for obedience. There's a the Old Testament reading we heard tonight, Hebrew Bible reading from 2 Samuel, is perhaps the, uh, the best introduction to Mary because she shows us a contrast, uh, and this text does as well. So we're going to turn there first, if you've got a Bible with you, 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 1. It's quite a famous text. It, it anchors the prophecies about the coming Messiah, making clear he'll be a descendant of David. But it's the actual exchange between David, carried on through the prophet Nathan, and the Lord, it shows us a really interesting contrast between himself and what we see in today's gospel reading. Uh, David says in verse 2, Nathan, I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. I need to build him a house, in other words. And Nathan, the prophet, who usually is quite measured in the way he talks to David, says, in a yes-man sort of way. Great boss, you go ahead and do it. A kind of enthusiastic yes, and affirmation. But then that night, the Lord calls Nathan up short, chastises him, and says, this is what I want you to tell to David. And we heard the text. But there's that one great line where the Lord says through Nathan, wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, I, don't, I don't know what motivated David, but from this distance, it looks kind of presumptuous, running ahead of the Lord, making a choice to do something for him rather than waiting on the Lord for instruction. I think we can empathize. Perhaps he felt a bit guilty, sitting in comfort as he was and thinking of the Lord sitting in a tent, though there was probably some error in that thinking. Maybe, not so righteously, he just wanted to show off. I don't know. But based on verse 8, it appears that the Lord was looking for gratitude for his faithfulness to his people and to David, and instead he got a bit of an ego-inspired offer of a donation. 
Note two, David's still at the place where he thinks the Lord needs a house. The Lord responds in two ways. Uh, he reminds David of all that he's done, all the ways he's taken care of Israel. And then he has Nathan say to him, David, I'm going to build you a house. I think there's a lesson here that applies down through the centuries. God's people should be careful when they presume to do things for him. Maybe none of you can identify with that behavior. I must say, unfortunately, I can. Times when I was intent upon serving the Lord by doing something for him, and then expecting him to make it prosper, even though he never asked for the help. Now, mind you, there are plenty of things we can do if we're walking with the Lord and know the Word that are righteous and good, and we can do them, and it's okay for us to do them, and we're doing it off our own bat, as the English say. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's very different than when we intentionally intend to do something for the Lord and are looking for some sort of super, supernatural pat on the back. It's a particular affliction of clergy and missionaries. They go somewhere thinking they're going for the Lord and telling him where they want to go. But, you know, it happens to lay people, too. I had a friend one time who bought a big bit of property with a very luxurious house. And I could tell he was feeling guilty because he said to me, you know, we're going to use this as a retreat center for the Lord. There's this danger we can fall into. Do you know people, for instance, who, some, who will say to you many, many too many times, well, the Lord told me, and they expect you to agree. They hadn't talked with anyone else. They hadn't consulted for affirmation of a call or of a direction. But they're usually saying, I had this private revelation, and the Lord told me, this is what I should do. And it's always suspiciously like what you suspect they want to do. This issue of confusing what we want with God's direction may have been what they probably was what David was doing, whatever his motivation. It's always dangerous to presume upon the Lord, and it's always wise to wait upon his instruction. But the Lord wasn't finished with David. Instead, he tells him in somewhat veiled words that... Uh, that his son will build the house, the seed of his own body, is the, are those old-fashioned words. And then he makes clear a point about his own identity. <clears throat> he shall build a house for my name. That is, the house he builds will be to establish my reputation among the nations. And by the way, David, I don't really need a place to live. We shouldn't miss that uh, making known the character and power of God is some place we all need to be, or something we all need to be aware of and looking to do. And then the Lord adds this marvelous, marvelous, clever turn of phrase, almost a pun. He finishes the sentence, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom, that is Solomon's kingdom, forever. And he makes it even clearer in verse 11. No, David, I'm going to build you a house, not a house of cedar, but a line of royal descent, the house of David. Your descendants will. And this incredible promise in verse 16, your kingdom and your house shall be established forever. It's really highly unlikely that, that David knew, knew that what the Lord was referring to was a coming Messiah. But age after age, the Torah tells us, the prophets repeat, this anchor in the house of David would be from whence comes the Messiah. He was thinking probably of things more immediate and personal, like we tend to do when we're doing something for the Lord. And we know from David's own words, he often thought in those terms. Nevertheless, the lesson is clear that the Lord said, this is what I will do. And it anchors in the past what came down through the centuries 
and what the Gospels tell us about Mary. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that there's a difference here between David's behavior and what we'll see in Mary. And I think the difference is a profound humility. And so if you go with me to the, the uh, Gospel text, Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 26, I'd like us to take a look at her life as we can see it, what happened that day, and maybe what it means for us. I think, too, we should do her the, give her the respect of calling her by her right name, Miriam. Uh, she deserves to be called by that name, given how she served the Lord. When she hears from Gabriel those interesting, interesting words. Greetings, O favored one. Her, her, her response is interesting. She said, when she heard these sayings, she was troubled, considering the manner of the greeting. I think this exchange deserves us looking into. I think in order to look into it, we have to have a pretty good grip as much as we can on who Miriam was. We don't know a lot about her. We know from the context that a ketubah, a marriage contract, had been signed sometime in the, last, in the previous months. Therefore, she was legally bound and betrothed to Joseph. Later in the text, she declares herself a virgin. Therefore, the marriage had not been consummated, unless, of course, of course, she presumed to lie to an angel. There's been a lot of speculation down through the ages about her age. We just don't know. We know she had to be a woman of childbearing age, probably young, could be as young as 14, more likely 16, 17, something like that, but we don't know. It's likely from what we read in chapter 3 of Luke, that she came from either a priestly or a Levite family, and that wouldn't be unusual, since so did Joseph. And so their arranged marriage would have been from within the same tribe. More importantly, uh, not more importantly, simultaneous Luke doesn't tell us much about her, her own history, nor does he tell us much about Gabriel, who came to visit her, except that angel Gabriel came and announced we sort of know that Gabriel is, the, is the, uh, the angel who always announces things. But in Jewish roots and Jewish teaching, the Talmud and other places, Gabriel is identified as the guardian angel of the Jewish people, as well as the angel entrusted with revelation. And perhaps for our purposes tonight, the Talmud, which may be legend, describes him as standing at the left hand of God taking the form of a man. Okay, so now, Miriam's in her room, and suddenly this strange and somewhat surreal figure of a man appears and says, Hail, O blessed one. Right, give that a moment, thought. And then what follows, after we hear she's troubled, is this blunt statement. Now, in the scriptures, it's put in quite careful words. But if we uh, paraphrase it in the speech we might use today, Gabriel says, you're going to get pregnant and bear a son, and you'll be the Messiah and reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, mind you, Israel had been at a fever pitch expecting messiahs for some time. Several false messiahs had come. And... One cannot only guess what was going through Mary's mind as she heard all this, Miriam's mind as she heard it, but she pauses and self-possessed asks the obvious question. How? I'm a virgin. Gabriel doesn't miss a beat in responding, but we have to recognize there's no place in the Mishnah or in the whole Hebrew Bible to find a reliable explanation or past precedent for this instruction to this woman. And Miriam, having come from an observant and studious family, we expect, uh, probably knew this, knew there was no past precedent. Uh, there is, of course, the text we mentioned earlier, uh, Isaiah 7, 14, that was mentioned by this chap we were talking to, you know, having coffee. But he was right. Hebrew is Alma, it means young woman. 
it might be presupposed at some secondary meaning that if it was a young woman in Israel who was part of a religious family, she would be a virgin. But that's not what the text says. So here, here is this young woman confronted by this imposing figure of a man telling her she's going to become pregnant by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. What do you suppose was going through her mind? I'm a virgin. How can this happen? For the next month, as this child grows within me, there will be constant gossip and judgment. Even when he's grown, people will be looking at him. We now know when he became famous, looking at him and saying, he's my bastard son. And my, what will Joseph think? We don't know what ran through her mind, but any one of those four things would be reasonable. But what I find extraordinary about Mary, whatever the internal turmoil is, whatever the clarity of the explanation given or not, the sharp difference between she and King David shows up very clearly. David wants to do something for the Lord. His motives aren't entirely clear. We know from the Psalms or the things about his history that he had a tendency to be asking for help when he was in trouble. He was really great about defending the Lord's name, not always so good at doing what he was supposed to do. And what does Miriam say? Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Maidservant. Maidservant. And then, let it be according to your word. Extraordinary obedience. How does someone who's 15, 16, 17 become that mature in the Lord? A marvelous disciple. Um, there's one more thing we should think about, about Mary, and then perhaps we can draw some conclusions from her life. You know, we only have a few shards of history in the scriptures about what happened to her. We know that she was a regular mother in the temple when she found Jesus who hadn't gone with the crew on the way back to Nazareth, and she scolded him a bit like any mother would. Now we know that she uh, told him what to do, or let him do it, at the wedding at Cana. But clearest to me, are the day that she stood with uh, her sister and Mary of Magdalene at the foot of the cross, of which John tells us, and she looked up at the battered, bloody body of her son hanging naked on the cross, and as far as we know, her faith never wavered that what was promised would come true. Extraordinary. We don't know anything about the rest of her life except that she went to live with John. Now, I don't know about you. I grew up as an evangelical Protestant who never looked at the life of Mary because it was too Catholic. But as I've grown older, and especially since that time two weeks ago, when I spoke with the, uh, the yeshiva teacher about the Virgin Mary, I've had to review again and again the quality of her discipleship. And you know, there's a lesson there for all of us. If you take your program, I think the lesson can be taught in her own words. On page two, the words we call the Magnificat poem we don't know when she wrote, really a, a hymn of praise, probably not exactly where it shows up in scripture, uh, but no doubt uh, true to her words as Luke recorded them later in her life. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. The Greek word there is easy to translate. It means to make it large. I had to ask myself how much of the way I live and talk 
makes the reputation of the Lord larger? Does my soul, that center of my spiritual being, magnify him? Does yours? In those moments when you're feeling most peeved or treated unjustly or unloved, can you wait for his words like Mary did? And if asked to do something, can you obey? And similarly for me at least, uh, sour pussies I can sometimes be, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. There's really no ambivalence about the word rejoice. It simply means be happy. In the face of incredible circumstances, Mary could rejoice. Can we? He's looked with favor on his lowly servant. She knew her place in the universe, who was in charge, who was created, who needed to be obedient. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. On what basis could she make that statement except by faith? Incredible, deep, mature faith that what she knew as a now pregnant young woman out of wedlock, as far as anybody else was concerned, except her cousin Elizabeth, whom the angel had reassured her, uh, was going to be kind of an anchor who she'd gone to see. Except for Elizabeth, who was going to believe what she said? But she could rejoice and she could say, on this day all generations will cause me blessed because I trust what I heard and I can obey it. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She understood that a holy God walks with holy people. I think we can safely presume she understood that's how she had to be and how she had to live. His mercy, he has mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. We live in an age that if it doesn't ignore the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, ridicules him and ridicules his son and considers those of us who follow him foolishly foolish. You know, it's not so far a feeling for us from what Mary must have felt as she looked around her society and received judgment and gossip and laughs. Of course, she's not pregnant by God. God didn't do this. God didn't overshadow her. What's she talking about? We know she just cheated, and Joseph was a nice guy and married her. But she feared the Lord. She trusted his holiness. And she knows that for people who fear him, from generation to generation, that he will have mercy on them. And he had far more than mercy on Mary. There's a few things more she said there, but there's one, one phrase that I think we should note. In the old Anglican prayer books, it doesn't read, um, I'm going to find it. Casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the, the lowly. Um, there's a wonderful phrase that's in, in the old prayer book that says he has uh, he's cast down the, the mighty in the imaginations of their heart. The imaginations of the human heart are not the same as the imaginations of an obedient disciple. So, I think all I need to say to all of us in conclusion is that we could, we could do far worse and we have an example of discipleship uh, better than Mary. Faithful to the very end, obedient from beginning to end, able to see far into the future because she trusted her Lord, and understanding her place before him. For me, it makes this particular Sunday 
in the Christian calendar especially meaningful. And I think probably it should for all of us. Let's pray. Father, it's uh, to you we look and to your Son. But sometimes the saints who've gone before us can set an example that inspires us. Thank you for Miriam. Thank you for the inspiration that she was and is and continues to be until that day that her son returns and sits rightfully on the throne towards which she looked her whole life. Give us her faith, we pray. Give us her trust in you. Give us her joy in our hearts. Give us her capacity for obedience. But most of all, Lord, may our soul, like hers, magnify you and your great and glorious name. In the name of the one who restored us to you by his death and resurrection, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. Amen.